Okay, so now we know where Santa Claus came from and how he became part of the American cultural repertoire. What we don't yet know is why we do it. What is the point of Santa Claus rituals in American society at Christmas time? That's the subject of the second part of this lecture. So why do Americans practice Santa Claus rituals? What do they mean? How do they function in American society? In its essence, Santa Claus practices in the United States comprise a domestic ritual with its own key symbols like Christmas trees and candy canes, uh, its own ritual practices like gift exchange and hanging up stockings, ritual meals eaten together by families and including special seasonal foods, and ritual prestation, that is, the giving of gifts within a defined social and ritual context. This gift exchange is at the heart of Christmas rituals and it is central to the Santa Claus ritual. Gift exchange almost always involves social rules of reciprocity, exchange with the understanding that the exchange creates a bond between the giver and the receiver. In most United States Christmas rituals, there are three basic forms of gift exchange. Gifts exchanged between family members, gifts exchanged between friends, and gifts exchanged from Santa to the family. The standard anthropological explanation for rituals of exchange are that these are rituals of social solidarity. In this sense, Christmas gift exchange can be seen as rituals of family so solidarity with many different functions. They express family relations, including uh, those of gender and age and status within the family. And they can serve to extend family relations by marking uh, some people um, who are not members of the family as a kind of fictive kin, friends who are close enough to the family to be included in the practice of Christmas gift exchange. One gives gifts to some friends who are very close, but one doesn't give gifts to everyone one knows because it's, it's too expensive. Gifts also mark social roles, like gender, we usually give different kinds of gifts to girls than we do to boys, um, but also social roles that are age-based social statuses. Um, part of the dramatic tension in the U.S. movie A Christmas Story is whether the boy is old enough to receive the air rifle that he so desperately desires. The modes of exchange in Christmas rituals reflect and reinforce family roles. Parents' greater domestic and economic power is reflected in the nature of gifts that they can give to their children uh, as opposed to the nature of the gifts that children can afford to give to them. This brings us to the question of the structure of the American family, which is prototypically conceived as a nuclear neo-local family, a family comprised of two generations, parents and their unmarried children. Nuclear neo-local families in the United States are marked by generational segmentation. When the children grow up, they leave home to create their, uh, get married and create their own nuclear families. Gift exchange is important because one of the things it does is maintain bonds between these segmentary generations. Gift exchange also creates fictive kin, as we mentioned before, um, in order to create networks of mutual support because nuclear families have far less support than joint families or extended families in which you have far more people contributing to the family income. Gift exchange builds these kinds of bonds through relationships of reciprocity. And as we've discussed in a previous lecture, there are three basic forms of reciprocity. First, there's generalized reciprocity, the exchange of goods and services in which neither the time nor value of return are specified, but some kind of balance is understood. It's understood in generalized reciprocity that I will give and um, although I will not specifically demand a return gift and I don't expect a, a gift of the same kind back from you, uh, I know that um, the, uh, the giving, uh, the bonds of giving will work out in the long run. Balanced reciprocity is very different. In balanced reciprocity, if I give a gift, I expect a gift of equal value in return. And the, um, the third kind of reciprocity is negative reciprocity, a system of exchange in which at least one party attempts to get something for nothing uh, without suffering any particular kinds of penalties. 
Generalized reciprocity is absolutely essential for nuclear neolocal families. Generalized reciprocity is the practice of reciprocity where I give without um, a clear expectation that I will get back. Imagine if parents gave to their children and then presented them with a bill at the end of their uh, 18th year. Um, you would never be able to pay it. You would never be out of debt. Instead, parents give to the children. They give them enormous amounts of time and energy and treasure. And at the end of that time, their children go off to give back to the world or to give back to their parents' grandchildren. And in this way, um, generalized reciprocity allows family to happen. Family can't happen in a system of balanced reciprocity. So in a nuclear neolocal family where you just have a few, you know, a handful of people living together, generalized reciprocity is very difficult to maintain when the entire world around you teaches you that the most appropriate form of reciprocity is balanced reciprocity, where you get something for everything you give. The existence of widespread markets that operate through supply and demand uh, affects gift exchange in the United States in a, a number of different ways. Market-based societies are dominated by balanced reciprocity. Balanced reciprocity in which for every exchange one expects a, a, an equal um, exchange in return, um, you know, such as you know, payment for goods, um, is a great way to run a business, but it's not a very good way to run a family. Even more problematic is the existence of money, which complicates the meaning of the gifts exchanged. When a new air man gives his son a cow in new air society, as we've uh, talked about um, in a previous lecture, that animal is unique. It has its own coloring, its own capacity for milk, its own voice, and so forth. New air cows are too valuable to sell, so cows can be compared only item for item, which is more beautiful, which is stronger, which is a better milker. But when money enters the picture, in a market economy, some of the uniqueness of gifts vanishes. All goods are convertible into money, so all goods can be compared according to that measure of value. Your gift is never unique. It can always be valued and compared. Market economies, like that of the U.S., also celebrate notions of consumer choice based on the concept of taste. Tastes are about social distinctions, differences that make a difference. Uniqueness and the translatability of all commodities into money and back again circles around these issues of taste. Tastes define who we are to ourselves as well as to others. If someone gives you a wrong gift, this is, becomes a meta-message about their awareness of you and their tastes and raises questions about whether they actually love you uh, in the way that gifts are supposed to express. This opens the possibility for reciprocity to work, not to build social solidarity, but to disrupt it. We call this agonistic reciprocity. In other words, where the classic model of gift exchange function involves solidaristic reciprocity, where exchange of gifts within the social expectations of reciprocity builds social solidarity, the presence of markets, money, and taste create the very real risk of agonistic reciprocity, an exchange of gifts that violates one or more social expectations and thus weakens or disrupts social bonds. Examples of agonistic reciprocity that are possible at Christmas time uh, becomes, you know, what happens if I receive a more valuable gift than I got, or what happens if I give a more valuable gift um, than I receive. What happens if my gift is misunderstood as intimate? Um, what do you give the person who has everything? What if someone gives me something that I just don't want? And what does it say about a relationship that they think that I would like this? Most American families develop mechanisms for dealing with agonistic reciprocity because they are so common. For example, uh, families may make a list of desired items so that if I don't know exactly what uh, to get J little Johnny, I can look at his list and pick one of the items on the list. 
Another mechanism that's used is capping the value of exchange goods so that a family may say, no one is allowed to buy gifts that cost more than $20. And Christmas is rife with stories expressing cultural themes that are meant to reduce the experience of agonistic reciprocity. Themes such as, it's better to give than receive, or it's the thought that counts. But the problem is not just managing agonized reciprocity. The problem is, how do parents teach generalized reciprocity to their children so that family can continue in a society that's dominated by markets and money and taste? In anthropological literature, generalized reciprocity is most commonly associated with something that's sometimes called the pure gift, the gift that's given with no expectation that you will receive something in return. Santa Claus represents the pure gift, in spite of the American embeddedness in the market economy. Here's how. Santa gives gifts to you, but you cannot give gifts back to Santa. Even if you leave out uh, cookies and milk for Santa, um, that's seen as a different kind of act. Uh, you're not buying the gift. You know you would get the gift anyway, and it's not of equal value to the gift. Santa expresses love by giving with no expectation of receiving. These mythic uh, themes are expressed in Santa Claus rituals. In family rituals, you receive pure gifts from Santa. Later in life, you learn that Santa Claus is really your parents. And ideally, you transfer the appreciation of receiving the pure gift onto them. And if the enculturation process operates effectively, you will become Santa Claus to the next generation. And family, cultural, and biological reproduction will continue. So, the answer to our question, why do Americans practice a ritual exchange in which a fat old man in red leaves gifts for children, is the spirit of the gift, especially generalized reciprocity, is essential to maintaining family bonds in a neolocal society. Market exchange mitigates against the formation of these bonds. Santa gives gifts that cannot be reciprocated, as Santa Claus doesn't even exist. Santa rituals thus socialize children into the spirit of the gift. And the end game of the Santa Claus ritual is that you grow up and become Santa Claus to members of the next generation, thus enabling cultural continuity. So there you have it. Santa Claus rituals as rituals of generalized reciprocity that enculturate children into the kind of pure gift giving that's necessary for families to survive and thrive in 21st century America and that allow us to make our form of family real from generation to generation. How are your Santa Claus practices? How does your family practice them? How well did your parents enculturate you into generalized reciprocity, the giving of gifts, so that you can pass it on to your kids? Have a good week.